Good afternoon. I'm Greg Niemeyer. I'm a professor of art practice at UC Berkeley, and I'm so thrilled to host Jenny O'Dell today in these on visual cultures. And Jenny O'Dell will be discussing the technologies of seeing. I almost said theologies of seeing. That's a whole different story. But um, uh, I'm going to share a few slides with you. I just want to acknowledge first that um, the land we are on and its history is both untold uh, need to be honored. And uh, I'd like to take a moment to do that. And I also would like to um, thank the Big Ideas course series in the Division of Letters and Sciences for supporting this course, which allows us to bring so many wonderful speakers to our campus. And I would like to thank the generous supporters of the Berkeley Arts and Design Initiative program, which um, is hosting us as well. And uh, Shannon Jackson in particular, the Associate Vice Chancellor for Arts and Design, who is leading Berkeley Arts and Design. And of course, Paris Coates, who organized the whole series for us. And Hala Kodura and Edgar Fabian Frias are two grad students in art practice at UC Berkeley who are supporting the students uh, through sections to deepen the lessons that we learn uh, in the larger lectures here. So thank you all so much. And um, I have a few comments about event protocol. So I'm glad you're all here. I'm glad we get to spend this time together. And uh, we are curious about your comments and questions. So we will track the chat and we will also collect all your questions in the Q&A feature located at the bottom of the screen. So um, we can ask uh, uh, these questions at the very end of the lecture. And if you're still there, we'll be uh, happy to bring your voice in um, for, for you to be able to ask the question directly. All this being said, it's my honor to introduce Jenny O'Dell. Jenny O'Dell is a wonderful Berkeley alumna, best-selling author, fabulous artist and acclaimed speaker. And she's returning to her alma mater with her lecture about attention. The discussion today is based on her book, How to Do Nothing, which has cited, which was cited as one of President Obama's favorites of 2019 and described by the New York Times as a complex, smart and ambitious book that at first reads like a self-help manual, then blossoms into a wide ranging political manifesto. I'm uh, happy that this wonderful book, which is so thoughtfully written, was um, very successful. And uh, uh, I also want to acknowledge that uh, I primarily know Jenny O'Dell as a wonderful visual artist who did um, uh, really interesting work with uh, satellite imagery, which is kind of manifesting a corporate perspective on the world. And she also managed to make a mural of uh, uh, satellite images on top of a on the facade of one of the um, data centers that serve up these images. So that was a very um, meta level uh, project. And uh, I often discuss that with the students in class. Um, uh, and uh, Odell learned much about attention from bird watching to observe birds, not just as instances, but as actors is bird watching in time, whether I'm observing moment to moment decisions or changes across the seasons. Her technologies of seeing don't involve machines as much as certain insight about being in the world and dissolving into pure observation. With that, I will uh, turn it over to our um, guest speaker today. And uh, this is where you normally would hear lots of applause, uh, Jenny, and we'd say, welcome, yay. And this is our last lecture of the semester. So this is a very beautiful um, that we get to uh, close with you. And at this point, I'm going to stop my video and you get to turn your zone and we're all set. How are you doing today, Jenny? Welcome. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm, all things considered, I'm doing okay. Um, <laughs> Uh, happy to be here. Um, and yeah, I'm just going to jump right into it actually and um, share some slides. Yes, please do. That looks great. Oh, that's uh, my crow friend there. Um, okay. Uh, cool. So, um, uh, yeah, so I, the, the talk that I wanted to give today, it's, um, it's based on um, a couple of different parts of um, what turned into my book, How to Do Nothing, but they're actually um, things that I've been thinking about for a long time. So this is um, this little kind of drawing is something that I made in um, 2016, early 2016, um, when I was kind of doing more visual art and I was trying to, um, I, was, I was trying to reconcile the fact that I made all of my art on a computer and was spending so much time inside, hunched over this computer 
um, and yet felt so much sort of allegiance toward to and like interest in the physical world. And I was kind of trying to think about like what that uh, that sort of paradox of my practice. Um, and so I, I, this is when I kind of started thinking about um, using um, and, and this is before I kind of even really started complicating for myself, like what the word technology means, but I was thinking about using digital means at this point um, to actually provide some kind of um, more elaborate experience of the physical world. Um, and this is something that I think this is a thread that has remained in my work and still part of um, my sort of practices of curiosity to this day. Um, but I, yeah, I made this little drawing and I just, it's like a little VR headset because I think I was just trying to think of like, what is the most sort of like techie technology, just kind of shorthand for for like new media art um, because I was also finding myself very, at the time, um, a bit frustrated with um, the category of art and technology in the Bay Area where sometimes it felt like it was just about the technology and it wasn't about anything else or, or what what's like new about your life after that or what are you able to see? And so I was thinking about how to use technology to augment elements of the human experience rather than flattening or um, attempting to replace them. Um, but to go even maybe further back, um, this this was just kind of like maybe the grown up version of also like a, a much longer um, obsession that I've had like since I was a kid with um, like the idea of like portals um, into some strange dimension that occur in the everyday. Um, and so I was very into, for example, um, things like the Magic School Bus episode where like the bus goes inside the human body. Um, the, I think it's very significant or it was significant for me that, um, uh, you know, in the Narnia movie, like it's in like, you go through the closet. Um, like it's this, this sort of uh, domestic, like banal space. Um, there's the kids room in, in Time Bandit that grows into a hallway that leads to the Napoleonic Wars. Um, and then of course there's um, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. And like for me, what I'm, I'm giving these examples because they're, because like I said, they're grounded in the everyday. Um, and I was, I, from a very early age, I was really obsessed with like zooming into things and zooming out. I don't think it's an accident that I ended up making work using satellite imagery. Um, and for me, it was sort of like the more banal, the better. Um, so uh, there was this idea that there are limitless perspectives and on anything and, and what we find there will always be surprising. Um, you know, I was also really into microscopes and, and things like that. And I just, <laughs> to kind of make this point, I just wanted to share this very weird excerpt from a story that I wrote um, when I was, I was very careful to specify in the story that I was eight and a half um and it is a story about me z getting zapped through my television screen because i pressed the wrong button on the remote and i end up in a parallel universe where the real michael jackson lives um and <laughs> i make friends with his daughter um and here he says like oh call me mike and i'm asking like how did he get into this parallel universe oh and that's also my microsoft paint like little um illustration of part of the story um, but he says, basically, he rolled up a bunch of things and, and sent them through a fax machine. Um, and then I say, only paper will go through fax machines. And he says, not in the old days when they just began discovering fax machines. Um, and I and I think this like illustrates, you know, that again, that like obsession with like the, the TV in your living room is a portal to somewhere else. But also, this, I think about this phrase a lot, like discovering fax machines. Like, I'm really interested in how children and artists approach technology um, and technological tools, um, which is why I'll, I'll talk about David Hockney in a minute. Um, but this, this idea that there's a different way to use them and that it will allow you to see something new that to me feels like sort of the opposite of like, you know, the like the sort of using, using it to do what you're expected to do, even in an artistic context, right? Um, to make something that looks sort of like of the moment or like schnazzy. Um, which is what I was trying to avoid as an artist um, later on. So, um, so yeah, just uh, again, just thinking about, um, you know, what like what does it even mean to to know a place? Um, like, what is the? What, there is no standard perspective on anything. Um, so I was, you know, always really taken with this uh, the the powers of ten film, where you know it zooms all the way out and then it zooms all the way in. <laughs> um, and uh, and I love I love the sort of like disorienting exhilaration of that feeling. Um, 
So as I said, I, I ended up in grad school making um, a lot of work using maps. Um, so I made some work using Street View um, where I went on a sort of fictional road trip across the US and I via Street View and I Photoshopped myself into all of these places. Um, and then at the same time that I was doing that, I was making these um, collections out of uh, things that I cut out from, from satellite view. And I, and I think that that's very, still actually pretty indicative of like the way that I like to even research things, which is like one of these is aerial and the other one is like kind of going through it. Um, and then of course, like visiting places in real life, like kind of trying to weave these all together. Um, and what then this, these pieces in particular, um, the point for me was to see and for the viewer to see how strange and specifically human our built environment looks. So I always picked things. I, I didn't actually at the time ever do any that were, um, you know, like natural features. They were always things like everyday things like swimming pools, um, water slides, just like thinking about the fact that how much engineering goes into the phenomenon of these things that allow humans to then slide down into a pool of water. Um, and I, my hope was that you would look at the piece and then you would walk around in your life and you would register the presence of things that you hadn't before because, because I had taken the time and I had suggested that the viewer take the time to like really notice and kind of try to like decode these things and, and appreciate their specificity. Um, and to just basically take visually take things less for granted. Um, and that's something that I often say about this work is that I, I love satellite imagery, but the work isn't about satellite imagery. It's about your experience after looking at satellite imagery. So zooming out to zoom in again. Um, so that's, um, you know, like that, that was my sort of approach to this idea. Um, and I, you know, this piece is from uh, 2014. And um, around that time, I was asked to give a lecture about um, David Hockney's video work that was at the De Young Museum for to the docents. Um, mostly because it was a technically it's a digital piece and I was a digital artist and I I that's the only reason I can think of that I was asked and I was actually a bit annoyed at the time because I was like I don't you know David Hockney's a painter and um you know like I don't really have anything to say about this um but then so I spent a really long time researching David Hockney and I and I ended up being really um inspired by his use of technology different forms of technology including fax machines actually but um and so, uh, and this and this sort of ended up being in chapter four of, of my book. Um, so just to give like a little bit of context, um, I think if you are familiar with David Hockney, probably think of him more as painter. Um, this is one of his more well-known paintings, um, kind of like stylized um, LA landscapes. Um, and um, so I started looking into his use of photography um, and it, I found that he generally hated it. Um, he found it dissatisfying because it was um, so frozen. It wasn't really related to the way that it, to him, to the way that we actually look at things. Um, he said, it's, it's all right if you don't mind looking at the world from the point of view of a paralyzed cyclops, um, but it, it's not what it's like to live in the world. Um, so he did use photography for studies for paintings, but it was really just kind of a tool, um, not, not something of interest to him as a medium. Um, and then there was sort of accidental thing that happened where a curator in 1982, a uh, curator from the Pompidou came to document some of his paintings with Polaroids and happened to leave behind some blank film. And he decided to walk around his house and take these photos kind of as he was walking in all different directions and then put them together later. Um, and this is a very different grid, for example, than like a comic book grid where it's sequential. Um, Lawrence Weschler has compared it to, or contrasted it with that kind of like sequential you know, like Edward Moybridge type of thing, saying that um, this instead depicts the experience of looking as it transpires across time. So like the act of walking and moving through the space is part of this. Um, and so he was kind of using the camera to undo the very essence of what we understand um, photography as, which is normally a framing of certain elements in an instant of time. Um, instead, um, you know, you can see like here, this sort of, um, the time functions in a really interesting way in these. Um, and in all of David Hockney's encounters when I was researching, um, anytime he encountered a new or started working with a new technology, even something like photography, he would always use the word like excited or accelerated. Um, so like here he says, from that first day I was accelerated. 
Um, like he got really excited that this thing that he thought was actually quite boring um, could be used to do like the opposite of what it's normally used to do. Um, and that he could use it to approach a more, for him, authentic experience of looking. Uh, where, for example, when you're talking to someone, um, uh, this is like an experience we all miss right now, but like when you're uh, in person talking to someone and you can see their face, um, you're not like staring at a point on their face. You're you're looking around, there's things happening, and you're kind of like constructing it and putting it all together. And that's an active process. Um, and, and this is something that he compared with cubism um, and its attempts to break with a frozen unified perspective. Um, he would say things like, there's nothing distorted about a Picasso painting. Um, and if there are three noses in a Picasso painting, it's quite simple. It means that you looked at the nose three times. Um, and he would compare things like um, this painting to uh, um, a painting of kind of through a, a more traditional one point perspective, like through the through the sort of keyhole perspective of like a, a woman at a bath um, by Watteau um, and saying that uh, in this type of painting, you're in the room um, and you're you're sort of embodied. Um, and that, that that to him was more realistic um, versus like photorealism. Um, and so, you know, he would make these pieces like this as this is like walking in the Zen garden um, where you see not only the garden, but you see also his system of looking at the garden, which is to take a step and then take a row of photographs sweeping upward and then take another step and then take another row. Um, so the act of looking is actually part of this part of the subject of this piece. Um, and he, um, he didn't see himself as using cameras to, use, to make photographs. Um, he considered what he was doing to be uh, drawing, uh, making lines in space. Um, he compared it to uh, using pencils to draw dots and then finding out that you can draw lines. So for him using a camera to just take one photo would be drawing a dot. Um, and uh, so this is, is probably one of his better known uh, photo composites, um, he called them joiners. Um, this took him nine days to make and two weeks to assemble. And he called it a panoramic assault on Renaissance one point perspective. So this looks kind of like it has one point perspective, but if you actually look closely at it, there's all kind of strange distortions and details that kind of are coming out at you. Um, and um, there's something that he has talked about a lot is the development of one point perspective as a literal technology of seeing. Um, that he does not enjoy um, and is always kind of trying to work against um, because he doesn't like the position that the, this puts the viewer in because there's one place for you. Um, you are here, you're looking through a sort of window and there's, there's this view and it's very determined uh, what that view is and sort of all of that is very static. Um, and it also sort of privileges this thing, this view over you. Um, like you're just sort of this disembodied witness um, he compared this, um, for example, to Chinese scroll painting, where um, it's not that there's not perspective, but it's not one point perspective. And there's so many different sort of vignettes and things going on. Um, sorry, this is really low resolution, but um, the, that your eye sort of constructs the narrative. Um, your eye, you are active in the, in the act of looking. Um, so he would do all kinds of weird things with perspective, like. Um, he was really into what he called reverse perspective, where he was actually trying to reverse it. Um, and here you can see more references to, to Picasso. Um, and so that's what he did with photography. And um, for the sake of time, I'm not gonna go into his whole um, thing with fax machines, um, but he had a period of time where he was very into making art with fax machines, um, just discovering fax machines. So the, the piece that I had been invited to, to that was the reason for me to be talking about this in the first place was um, from Seven Yorkshire Landscapes, um, which he made by mounting a series of cameras to the side of a car and driving down a country road uh, near where he grew up. And um, the cameras here are, uh, they're not, this, I'm, I'm not totally sure about the technical um, specifics of this, but they basically weren't aligned. Um, so it's not a continuous image. Um, there's sometimes it seems like some of them are more zoomed in um, or they're just the way they're lined up is not exactly, um, you know, flush. But um, 
So there's, there's some disconnection among the panels and that's actually really important because it tricks your eye into looking closely at the textures in each different area because it, the, the way it's structured suggests that there's something to be seen in every panel. Um, this is still from just someone's YouTube video um, visiting one of these pieces and it's these kids that are just like running around and looking at all of the different squares, which I think proves his point where he says, um, he says the composition stays the same and you just slowly go past a bush. There's so much to look at that you don't get bored. Everybody watches because there's a lot to see. There's a lot to look at. And then he compares it to regular TV. And he says, if you show the world better, it's more beautiful, a lot more beautiful. The process of looking is the beauty. Um, and, and so this is the sort of setup that he used. And he talks about how, um, you know, no, he had, they had to just like figure it out, um, like, because no one was doing that. Um, he says, we found a way of making the technology work for us. Um, those behind the technology know that they need these mad people to come along and find ways of using it. Um, and so there he is in the car. And I just, um, as a side note, I find it very charming that um, he's so into observation that while he was sitting in the car, he like made an iPad drawing <laughs> of the setup itself. Um, but, um, but yeah, the, the sort of my experience of this piece um, and the docent accounts of this piece um, are that it does kind of do that thing that I was talking about earlier, um, where you go outside and things sort of look different. Um, many people told the docents that they would go to the botanical gardens across the street from the Diang or across the way and um, that everything sort of looked different to them after having viewed this piece. Um, this piece acts like a prosthesis that allows you to see something that was already there. Uh, it just gives you more access. And uh, it, it's an example of what Hockney talks about as looking as a positive act um, and suggesting that the familiar and nearby environment is worthy of the same kind of attention that you would bring to something in a museum. Um, so this kind of was really inspiring to me in thinking about um, different uses of technology, again, um, using it in unconventional ways, but also unconventional ways that place you back in the physical world. Um, this is my heavy handed example um, in contrasting these different uses is for example, uh, using, uh, you know, like a, a constellation identifying app to look at the sky um, versus like playing Candy Crush on the train. Although I'm not gonna judge anyone who plays Candy Crush on the train, but the, but right, they're like one, it's the same, it's the same tool, but one is kind of like, um, embedding you more in the world, the other one is kind of like screening it out. Um, and so I started thinking about how all, you know, most of the art that I liked was based in observation and that it led to increased sensibility of some layer of existence. So physical environment, um, social environment, and the historical layer um, that's existing in everything. Um, so just a few kind of quick examples. Um, this is a a piece by uh, James Bully and Daniel Jones called Living Symphonies, um, where they worked with ecologists, from, this is in the UK, um, from the Forestry Commission. And they made a detailed ecological survey um, to record the behaviors of plants and animals living within a 600 square meter and 25 meter high section of woodland. So they picked an area that was very defined um, and they, they studied those behaviors. Um, and then they created motifs, uh, aud um, audible motifs, featuring more than 120 instruments um, based on those behaviors. And then, uh, uh, so those were, they plugged those into the 3D survey of the forest and then played it by um, responding in real time to the, sorry, responding in real time to the time of day and the weather. That sounds really complicated. The Basically the point is that they made a sound composition based on the behaviors of organisms in the space. And then they gave it a sort of gener generative element by linking it to time of day and weather. And then they then they placed that sound installation back in the space. So you would go there and you'd be hearing it and it would be sort of rendering audible something that is there, that you know time of day and these organisms, um, but were not sort of perceptible or sensible to you. Um, and I, I really love um, <laughs> the documentation of this piece because it's just people kind of like, hanging out and uh, listening. Uh, an example of something that renders the social more sensible is this piece by Camille Utterback, who um, is a big inspiration to me, also teaches at Stanford. 
Um, and this was uh, how it looked at the Contemporary Jewish um, Museum in 2015. So it's a set of scrims that you can see here um, onto which is projected this composition that she has made and the composition uh, reacts to your movements. So there's cameras that are also installed. Um, the actual composition itself is sort of abstract, but it contains things like wires and, and um, I think there's like maybe even earbuds in there, like just kind of like in t um, digital things with a digital association, but also things that get tangled. Um, and the interesting thing to me about this is that it's, it's rendering your movement visible, but then when you leave, the effects of your movement are there. And there's also the ability of, to have someone on the other side doing their own thing. So your movements are getting mixed together, but regardless like you are confronted with the, the traces of someone else um, who may have been there before you. Um, and she said in an interview, I was thinking about this idea of how entangled we are literally with our technology, but how hopefully this piece entangles you more physically with people in the space. Um, and then as an example of the of rendering the historical more sensible, um, this is something you really have to, I think, watch on your own time to, to get the full um, experience. But this is a still from Erica Molesworth's Silicon Landscapes. Um, and this is a film where she walks around the rooftop garden of one of the buildings on the Facebook campus um, very slowly uh, with an extremely smooth, I don't know what she was using, one of those, I forget what they're called. Um, but it's really, really smooth, slow, surreal kind of tracking shot that just go, goes around this garden. And then there's this, this kind of like heavenly music playing in the background. And then it's her speaking and it's a narration about the evolution of the, the modern knowledge worker and environments that were designed for the modern knowledge worker um, that are supposed to be these kind of spaces of leisure and uh, you know, like conversation and innovation. Um, and it's, again, it's really hard to, to evoke, you really have to just watch the film, but it's, it's like equal parts surreal, creepy, like this kind of, um, it really takes this like techno-utopian aesthetic and just by simply like slowing down and kind of staring at it, ren renders it very, very absurd, very quickly. Um, and, and also it's slow enough that you kind of notice these little details like the maintenance workers um, who are also on this campus. And it just, it's the slowness of it. Like that's the artifice. Um, and it, it really kind of calls into question um, so much about the circumstances around something like this. Um, and then I, you know, I myself, um, I would say that this project that I did when I was at the dump in San Francisco, uh, Recology SF, um, kind of falls into this category of, of creating an artifice where you can pay more attention to something. Um, so in this project, uh, this is from 2015, I created an archive of 200 objects that I pulled out of the public disposal area and then spent um, longer and longer amounts of time researching uh, where they were made, what they were made out of, why they were made, um, are there reviews of this thing online, are there commercials for it online, um, kind of like the whole life story of, of each object. And so yeah, go into the public disposal area um, with my shopping cart that we were given. Um, and then I would photograph the objects uh, kind of similar to like a, a product photo. And then I would um, just try to figure out, you know, what, try to account for this object's life, uh, basically. Um, so this is, a, for example, a, a bottle that I was only able to figure out what it was by putting the serial number on the bottom into Google image search and then using Google Translate on a Chinese, it was a Chinese forum um, to, to just learn about what kind of alcohol had been in this bottle basically and this this like American bro trying to drink it. Um, so um, yeah this is a um, it is now a tumbler um, and it's also a book um, but it's basically just like a compendium of information um, and I think more importantly, the, the way the design uh, of the exhibition worked was it was kind of just like a library. Um, so each object had a tag on it that you could scan. Um, there was also just like the, the analog version for if you didn't want to do that, there were these kind of books. And you could stand in front of each one. And for example, like maybe look at the factory where it was made on Street View, um, watch the commercial for that thing. Um, and so I was really kind of trying to 
destabilize these objects um, and also encourage, again, encourage the viewer to then, because this happened to me, we go home and suddenly like everything looks this way, right? Like you're drinking out of a cup and you're like, where did this cup come from? And it's again, very disorienting. Um, and it was around that time that I came across this idea um, from George Perec uh, in, in a text called The Infraordinary. Um, this idea of the infraordinary, infra meaning in between, um, something that's so ordinary, it's invisible. <laughs> it's something I, I, um, I used to teach design and uh, something that we talk about a lot in class is like, how do you even seek out and observe the infraordinary? Um, and I think it's, it's significant that in this case, he, he puts it forth as a prompt, like describe your street, describe another street, question your teaspoons, right? As a challenge, um, like it's something, it's not going to come to you without that, whatever kind of mental artifice that is. Um, and this is a, a tech from a text of his that I really enjoy called an attempt at exhausting a place in Paris, um, where he just goes and sits in the same general vicinity, um, the square in Paris on several different occasions and just writes down everything that he notices happening kind of like a police blotter. And again, this is that challenge to the self, like setting up an area, setting up a period of time. Okay, I'm going to do this, and like seeing what comes into that. Um, and before he gets into this, he has a kind of preface where he describes all of the kind of proper nouns in the square. Like, there's this church, and there's this shop, and they have these names. Um, and he says a great number, if not the majority, of these things have been described, inventoried, photographed, talked about, or registered. My intention in the pages that follow was to describe the rest instead that which is generally not taken note of, that which is not noticed, that which has no importance, what happens when nothing happens other than the weather, people, cars, and clouds. So again, it's really this uh, challenge. And I actually did this um, in the Facebook quad. Um, and uh, well, I was, I did an artist residency there and um, I can't share it with any, I can't like put it on my website or anything because um, I did probably see me, but um, but it is, it was, that document only becomes more surreal as time goes on, I'll just say that. Um, so, uh, and there's, there's, there was a sort of interesting afterlife to the Bureau of Suspended Objects um, project, which was that at the Contemporary Jewish Museum, um, I was invited to participate in a project where they gave this kind of interstitial window space to an artist and um, someone not working in the visual arts where you would collaborate and create some kind of installation here. And um, I asked to be paired with a window designer um, because um, after I had been at the dump, I had this kind of like, I don't know, it's not a crisis, but everything, when I would go to the store, everything would look like trash to me. Um, and then everything at the dump had not looked like trash to me. And I kind of came to the conclusion that like either everything is trash from the minute it's produced or it's not, um, nothing is trash. Um, and that like trash is like a decision that you make when you're dealing with an object. It's not, there's an, oftentimes like it's, there's things can be repaired. They're not even broken in the first place. Someone just didn't know what something was. Um, there's no longer a context for it, but like trash is an abstract concept. Um, and I was also thinking about my old job um, at a, a Gap corporate where um, there was basically a fake building where they would get all of the samples um, months in advance and they would set up this fake store and then I would have to go in and take hundreds of photographs and communicate those to all of the Gap stores in North America. This is where you put the shirts. Um, and I was watching my coworkers take these samples that were straight from, you know, like Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, you know, clearly cheaply made and then uh, put them on the wall just so now it's $30. And like, I. I was aware that that happens, but it was very different to actually see it. So I was just thinking about these, like, you know, what, how the context affects the objects that we're looking at. Um, so I got paired with um, Philip Buscemi, who's in the center here. Um, he works for Ken Folk, who's on the, uh, sorry, on the right there. Um, and they have done interiors for, uh, for example, the Battery, which is a club for rich people in San Francisco. And so I collaborated with him and he took me to their warehouse where they had all these kind of like you know, things from surf stores next to like a $30,000 chair. Um, and, and he totally got what I was talking about immediately where he's like, oh yeah, we do that all the time. You like put something in a certain context, it looks different. Um, and so we ended up um, together uh, 
designing this installation where it's basically a cabinet of curiosities where there's three different categories. One is um, new things from Walmart, Target, and I think Hobby Lobby is in there um, that I was going to return after the show. And then the middle one is my objects, my possessions. Um, and then the third one is things from the dump. And the idea was to completely kind of equalize the visual context. Um, so, uh, and so that's an example of this kind of like framing I want the thing that I wanted to render visible was the kinds of significance and associations that we attach to objects. Um, there's something really weird about looking at the first section where you you know these things are just objects that I'm going to return to Walmart, but you can imagine them sort of being on the mantle of in some home where some kid is growing up and then that is going to become a really familiar object. Um, so um, so yeah, I started thinking about, um, uh, you know, I, I kind of asked this question in my book, but this is when I came, I kind of came to this idea, like um, what, what really is a technology of seeing? Like what, it, what if it's just a decision um, or, or, or an art, art piece that invites you to make a decision to look at something differently? Um, isn't that augmented? Isn't that augmenting your reality? Um, and so I was thinking about, you know, technology of seeing um, could be something like a microscope, but it could also be something like Duchamp's urinal, which by placing it in that context um, invites you to look at it as something very different than the urinal in the bathroom. Uh, technologies, of, technologies of hearing for me would include hearing aids, but also John Cage's 433, um, where the, the player sits at the piano, doesn't play anything for a specific period of time. And the piece itself is composed of the ambient sounds in the room, which are different every time. Um, which you might not be aware of otherwise. Um, one of my favorite films, which is, um, I cannot find anywhere now because I saw it at an international film festival um, and it, it's very poorly reviewed. <laughs> Nobody likes this movie except for me. Um, it, it's this, I'm, I'm not even gonna describe it because there's not really a plot. It's just that there's like a, a guy who forgets something at home one day um, in the middle of the day and he goes home. And it's that thing like when you're a kid and. If you, if you ever like stayed home sick and your house looked kind of strange because you were never home in the middle of the day, it's like a similar thing. And it just kind of like throws him off. And the whole rest of the film is him kind of like rediscovering the, the world as if he were like an alien. Um, so just kind of like throwing things out the window and like watching them fall on the ground or like lying in weird places. Um, but this is kind of how, um, I, I love this film because it's like, it can be very subtle, like you can, be only slightly askew and then everything appears like very strange um, very quickly and it kind of comes back to that idea of the, of the portal in the everyday. Um, so this, you know, uh, was something that I had been thinking about already and um, and then it, as I write about in the book uh, in 20, late 2016 after the election and also after the ghost ship fire um, here in Oakland, I was finding that I was spending a lot of time in this rose garden, uh, which is also my virtual background. Um, near my apartment um, and just kind of like sitting there and not doing anything, pretty much just like shell shocked um, and like not even really aware of like why I was going there all the time. Um, but inevitably as my attention kind of started to settle in this place, um, I started thinking about the structure of that park and why it was so easy to be there for a long time. Um, it's kind of designed almost like a labyrinth part of it um, and I and I started to think about that itself as an example of what I've been talking about, which is a structure that allows you to pay more attention. Um, so a labyrinth lets you inhabit a space without standing still, but without moving through it either. Um, I, this is also when I really started getting into bird watching. I'd had both of these things for many years, uh, and I did not use them until until 2016. Um, and I started to learn, you know, I started to kind of like look around, realize that like the Bay Area is in a very, a very important part of the Pacific Flyway that, um, you know, just I started learning about um, all, you know, slowly the different species of birds. Um, and then the, the year after that, I was commissioned to write something for SFMOMA's open space about bioregionalism, uh, which is basically the sort of awareness of one's ecological context, watersheds. Um, I would include the indigenous history of a place in that as well. And so 
um, I went up to uh, basically the Klamath Mountains area. Um, and these are some sort of illustrations that I made for that piece, which is the piece is about me sort of being like this like stumbling, <laughs> like I don't know anything. And I'm it's like, I'm trying to like learn this language basically. Um, in that journey, iNaturalist was really important for me. It still is, I use it a lot. Uh, it's an app uh, it started at Berkeley um, that lets you take photos of plants, uh, even animals. And it will, it uses machine learning to suggest something, but then it's ultimately confirmed or corrected by a person. Um, and I think it now is owned by the um, Cal Academy of Sciences. Um, so these are some of my recent observations. Uh, I also went to an iNaturalist happy hour maybe last year and I met some of the people who had been confirming my, or correcting my um, observations. So that was really cool. Um, so just kind of like slowly learning um, this past year because I'm now writing a book about time. Um, I have been getting really into geology. Um, so that's a whole other layer. Um, I, this is a photo, I just took, I'm including this photo to give an example of like, I usually bring binoculars to look at birds, but I've, I'm now I find that I'm using binoculars to look at faraway rocks. Um, and I'm, I'm having the same question about rocks that I had years ago about birds, which is like, did I just not notice these before? Uh, and as I often say, uh, what did I think they were just rocks? Um, as if they're just there, um, uh, rather than the outcome of very real and specific phenomena that happened a long time ago. Um, and so this, I, what I'm describing is basically this term that I use, um, the observational eros, which I made up. Um, <laughs> and to describe this feeling, an example is this passage from Cannery Row that I actually encountered in high school and have always remembered, which is about um, how in order to observe something very closely, you have to kind of be very still. Um, and um, and so almost almost like erase yourself in order to, to actually like see fully what is there, something that could be very delicate. Um, and so I just want to kind of talk about really quickly, like where this, I think where this leads. Cause I, I when I wrote the original talk, how did you know thing it kind for me, it's almost like ended here. Um, it's like the observational arrows. Um, but it's kind of where this, where this leads in my experience. Um, so first I think what happens is like you kind of, are able to distinguish more. So I would say it's like a higher resolution um, attention. So I might, these are all kind of like ecological examples, but this is, uh, I got really excited recently when I learned how to distinguish male and female bush tits, which are these really, really, really tiny, like the smallest birds. And they're everywhere in my neighborhood. Um, they, are the, they are the star of my uh, review that I wrote for the Atlantic about uh, bird behavior books. Um, but you can see the female has like a, a lighter eye um and so like this is just an example of like okay you're paying closer attention you notice oh something that you thought was one thing is actually two things and then it gets more and more kind of granular and then then there's like the element of time uh so in how to do nothing i write about bird space and bird time so this is a western tanager which only comes through my neighborhood um you know in the fall and the spring it migrates through <laughs> And it also uh, looks different during different times of the year, like many birds. Um, also, I'll just share that I have a Western tanager on my, wait, let me make sure this is working, uh, on my hat. Um, so big Western tanager fan. Um, so there's that space, space and time element, um, which birds occur where birds have hangouts, you know, just because there's a range on a map doesn't mean they're like equal, equally distributed in that area. Um, and then I, and then I started noticing, you know, behavior. Um, so this is what a bush tit nest looks like. Um, and in this book, uh, which also has a Western tanager, what it's like to be a bird, um, uh, by David Sibley, which is one of the books that I reviewed. Um, there's a, there's a page that shows a step-by-step -step construction of a bush tit nest. And ever since I read that, I now in the spring, I will see them do that. And I will under be able to understand like what step they're on. Um, okay, so that's one, you know, and then I would say where that it then leads further is to a more kind of like emotional investment. Um, this is from Robin Wall Kimmerer's amazing book, Braiding Sweetgrass. Um, she talks about this um, idea of species loneliness, um, which is the loneliness that humans experience 
um, and being cut off from and unfamiliar with um, other species. Um, and she says, as our human dominance has grown, we have become more isolated, more lonely when we can no longer call out to our neighbors. Um, it also um, brings to mind Martin Buber's um, idea of I thou, uh, which I also talk about in the book. And his example is a tree. So <laughs> this is a picture of my cousin's baby. Um, but I, I chose this because this tree, it's in a park and every time I see it, there's kids on it. I've never walked past this tree when it didn't have kids climbing on it. And even though, um, this, you know, he's a baby, but didn't stop him from trying. Um, so Martin Buber gives the example of a tree. Um, so you're looking at a tree um, and he says, he goes through all these ways that you could look at the tree. Um, you, could, you could see it as, um, you could accept it as a picture, visual elements. You can consider it as an instance of a species, an expression of a natural law or a pure relation of numbers. And he says that throughout all of this, the tree remains my object and has its place and its time span, its kind and its condition. Um, and that's I, it, but I, thou, um, he says, it can also happen if will and grace are joined that as I contemplate the tree, I am drawn into a relation and the tree ceases to be an it. The power of exclusiveness has seized me. Um, and he says, the tree is no impression, no play of my imagine, imagination, no aspect of the mood. It confronts me bodily and has to deal with me as I deal with it only differently. Um, and, um, and so, and, and yeah, uh, and he says, oh, does this mean that the tree has consciousness? No, he says, it's not, a, it's not a dryad, a tree with a spirit. It's a tree, it's the tree, <laughs> right? It's irreducible. Um, and uh, it, um, this is a photo that I took recently in the Santa Cruz mountains, which I have always had a, a very, um, I have a lot of feelings about the Santa Cruz mountains because I grew up um, going to them a lot. Um, and this is a passage from uh, an essay by Gloria Bird where she um, notices that her, um, her grandmother says poor thing um, while referring to a mountain. Um, so she spoke of the mountain as a person. And I would just kind of go back and contrast this again with the one point perspective, you know, in addition to David Hockney's critique of this as, as being very static, it's also very separate. Um, the, the model of looking in this is like, I am here and that is there and we have no relation, we, I am not embodied I'm, I don't have an embodied relationship with what I'm looking at. I have, and I have no investment in this. Um, and so as, a, as an example of kind of, you know, that uh, all of these things that I've been talking about wrapped up, um, uh, I, would, I would put as an example, the crows that I have now known for more than four years um, on my street um, that I started trying to befriend after I learned in a, a book about birds that crows can recognize human faces. Um, and this is a, I had to share this photo, the very nice photo that my boyfriend took of one of them the other day. Um, and I, I mentioned them in the book, but I also, I also talk about them in the Atlantic um, review of bird behavior um, because kind of the thesis of that review is that the more, actually sometimes the more you learn about something, the more mysterious it becomes. It's not like you, you have a grasp or control of it. It just becomes more mysterious. Um, and so I said in this review, um, I've had four years to observe the behavior of one crow family. I've seen them groom one another, forage in the neighbor's roof gutter, peck curiously at mushrooms, wipe their beaks on the power line, yawn, scold a hawk or a cat, do barrel rolls when it's windy, and sometimes follow me down the block, landing on various branches near my head. Lately, they seem to enjoy my hiding a peanut for them under a pile of driftwood and pine cones, and they once moved a small rock from one side of my balcony to the other. Why they did this is a deep mystery. The more I observe them, the less of a grasp I feel I have on them. Instead, they look more like more and more like willful individuals. Um, so just to return to this, I think there, there are two ways that this has become kind of, um, uh, that this has become elaborated for me. Um, one is that technology has a much wider definition for me. Um, I, binoculars are an example of technology, for example, but also I would say frame of mind um, is a technology. Um, and then two, um, this is not a one-time deal where you run through this process and then you're done. It's not purely additive as if there's simply more things in your world as before, but you stay the same. Um, but rather the process of observing draws you into relationship. Um, it's destabilizing. And um, 
the, these are some photos that I took at early pandemic. I set up a tripod and just kind of pointed the camera out my window. Um, this will always be true so long as like there's time, right? Like we exist in time, there will always be more. Um, there will always be more complexity and, uh, and you will sort of continue to evolve as well. And it's just something I've been thinking about a lot as I said, I'm writing this book on time. Um, and when I think about this, I often think about um, one of the places that I really miss right now because it's indoors. Um, it's the Chapel of the Chimes in Oakland. It's a columbarium. So um, each of these kind of compartments has an urn with ashes in it. And oftentimes there's like personal belongings and um, it's kind of like a library of lives. And sometimes urns are literally shaped like books um, with you know a whole family and there's like each spine. Um, and so there's an urn in here that ha is printed with a photo of the woman whose ashes are inside. And she's sitting in a redwood forest and she's looking up and she's just enjoying being there. Um, and I think about that all the time. It's like there was this window of time where she was alive and she enjoyed what was here. And then that window closed. And, I, and that's kind of like, when I think about, you could ask like, what is the point of observing that to me that is the point like you're you're here <laughs> why, why not be more here why not make the most of being here um, and to me that means being awake receptive willing to be surprised moved changed um, and that observation is a form of conversation with what and who is around us um, even with things that you would consider inanimate or western culture would consider inanimate um, where the boundaries of the self are continually unsettled and resettled. And actually, just to end, David Hockney had a version of this thought um, in one of his interviews where he says, um, it's the journey that counts, not the destination. In the 60s, American car manufacturers for 20 years never made a convertible car because Ralph Nader said they were unsafe. A lot of people thought it was right to stop making them. And I pointed out that this argument is terrible because what he's saying is that the destination is more important than the journey. He'll get you there safe, but you'll be in a tank, sealed. Well, I'd like to look at the trees on the way. I want to enjoy the journey because I know perfectly well what the destination is, oblivion. So meanwhile, I'd like to be able to see the world. Thank you so much. Um, what a beautiful talk. And uh, we're giving you lots of applause here. <laughs> Um, and there's lots of comments and messages to follow up with. So uh, I just wanted to um, say what your talk reminded me of a, the Heidegger quote that the truth is shy. And if you, mm. if it's, you know, it, if you come, come at it too quickly, it runs away. And so, so the way you observe the world and the rocks reminded me of how maybe the truth reveals itself because you are still. And uh, mm -hmm. I wonder if you had any thoughts about that. Yeah. Um... That's funny, it's reminding me of a, a mostly bad poem that I wrote in undergrad at Berkeley when I was in the poetry workshop. But I remember that uh, I had a line about the, the tale of truth like disappear disappearing around a corner, that yep. it was like yep. sneaky. Yeah, yep. it's sneaky. And, and um, it, it, it's funny because on the one hand it's sneaky, but on the other hand, it's like, I think what I like about this stuff is like, it's it's the thing that was actually also right in front of you. So I'm thinking about um, like in the summer, I was walking through this park that I have gone to probably like every other day. It's a very familiar park. And um, there's lots of juncos in this park, which is another, it's a very common bird. And so I was walking along this path and I saw a junco fly out of some ivy into a tree. And then I looked at where it had flown out and I was looking, I was looking right at it. I could see like all the leaves and everything. There was a baby junco in a little nest and it was like staring right back at me. But it took me wow. about six or seven seconds to see it. And I, and then I actually said, I was alone. I said, oh my God, out loud and like jumped back um, because it was just, you know, and I, and then the whole rest of the walk, I was thinking about like the six or seven seconds where I didn't see it. And like yeah. what is happening and they're like the patterns have just sort of not congealed and and the fact it's to me it's significant that like that's a common bird right that's not a juncos are not a bird that like birders are necessarily going to get really excited about but that was so surprising to me and so 
you know, um, didn't really matter. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful story, beautiful moment, unexpected life showing up, right? And it, it saw you probably the whole time. Okay, so Hala and Edgar, um, how do you want to proceed with questions? Yeah, I'll, I'll start. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Jenny, for this very inspiring talk. Me and Edgar were just like texting. I'm like, oh my God, this talk is amazing. Um, you. Been talking about mind mindfulness and stillness. Um, um, so thank you so much for this talk. I'm going to start with a question from our student, Ethan Pack, and his question is, as a writer, how do you translate your thoughts into the page and into your work? Can you explain your writing process? Um, that's a very salient question right now because I, I don't know if I understand it. I'm trying to because I'm trying to write this second book. Um, I, I would say um, if I had to think of some sort of metaphor for it, I think of it not as necessarily like additive, like, um, although obviously you have to write, you know, you have to write words sequentially, but it feels more like, a, like I think of like chemistry experiments because it feels like what happens is I have some sort of like overall hunch or something. And then I, and then I read some things and they react with that and then that creates a new thing and then I have some unexpected experience and then that it's like things are like reactive agents rather than things that are kind of like sitting on top if that makes sense um and I say that because those reactions take time and it, you like patience I think is a really underrated part of the writing process where sometimes you you have the information or you have some perspective and it's just not congealing and there's nothing that you're going to be able to do to force that to congeal. It's just, you, you know, you probably just need a good night's sleep or you need, or like you have a conversation with a friend unexpectedly, it all comes together. Um, and so I'm very, I, I have a lot of humility in terms of like the, how important that is and that I, you can't force that. And that that's something that comes from outside of you. Um, yeah. It's almost like, or like a meteor or something that comes, I don't know. Um, so I, I feel like the writing, the writing, writing part, like, you know, making sentences and trying to make it sound good. Like that's, that's the craft. I mean, I actually don't see that as all that dissimilar from visual art, but the, but that sort of ideas part and like what, what it is that you're even writing in the first place. I, I still find that incredibly difficult. And, um, and um, yeah, like I said, sort of really requires patience and trust um, in this like weird, congealing process that I don't really understand. Thank you so much. Patience and trust. Uh, I'm going to now move it to Edgar. Oh, thank you so much, Jenny. This has been so incredible. Definitely want to echo what Hala said. Um, really feel inspired by this conversation. Um, and I just wanted to share a question from one of our students. Um, her name is Isabel Reich, and she asked, what advice would you give to your younger self? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think the advice I would give my younger self is to be um, kinder to myself. Um, uh, I have, I don't know if it's the benefit of, I have journals going all the way back to like when I was like eight. Um, and there, so I have, I know what I would, I, I have some idea of the kinds of things that I was thinking about and what I thought about myself. Um, and, and I should, and I, this is, I mean, I would give myself this advice even today, right? It's like really hard um, to, to take, to have like fellow feeling with yourself, like to be friends with yourself. Um, like there's just this, you know, other than the whole, the grind of like work or a job, there's like this there's like a grinding mindset that I think um, is really, for me, has been, you know, all too easy to take on. So, um, you know, like, I, I feel like if I now were encountering myself in college or especially grad school, I would, I would be the person being like, just like, take a breath and like, you know, or take a nap. Um, and like, it's, it's okay. Like, it's not everything isn't the sort of like, fire alarm and and like you haven't totally fucked everything up and um 
it's not the there's more leeway here than you think there is. So just kind of like trying to cultivate some ease um, with, and I, I think like it's something that I've been trying to do actually right now. So maybe this is the advice I would give myself. It's like, I try to take a couple minutes at the end of the day to just like, to, to just have that feeling, like sit down and be like, and kind of drop all the stuff, you know, like the other day I was having, I was really struggling with this chapter that I'm writing and I, and I was just in that like struggle mindset like all day. And then I was like, I don't wanna go to sleep in this mindset. Like I wanna like drop that for a minute and like, yeah, I'm a writer, but I'm like more than that. And so I'm just as a person, I'm gonna like sit down here and be like, you know, how are you doing <laughs> as a person? And just kind of like be kind and, and, then, and then I can go to sleep. So that's the advice I would give. Uh, thank you so much. That your words are powerful medicine. Really appreciate it. Do we want to do one more quick question before we wrap it up? Are you good with that, Jenny? Yeah, sure. No, not okay. Great. Back to you, Hala. Thank you. I'll take a question from the audience. Is Ann Walsh still with us? Say the name again, please. Ann Walsh. Oh yeah, sure. One sec. Yep. And hi, you're uh, allowed to talk now, I think. Great. Hi. Thank you so hey. much, Jenny. Um, appreciate your talk so much. Um, I just wanted to ask a really specific question about one of the pieces that you showed really early um, in your talk that was the, the kind of the sound composition that based on um, Birds, bird song and environmental sound in Golden Gate Park, I guess, or near the De Young. And I don't remember exactly where it was done, but it was like a collaborative of artists that. Oh yeah, that was in the UK. Yeah. Oh, it was in the UK. Okay, sorry. Um, so I was really curious. I was thinking about work done by um, an audiologist who became, uh, who you probably know, Sandy Stone or she began as an audiologist. And um, I was really curious whether um, the sound composition that they produced, that the installation produced was ever like studied for, for the ways in which it affected bird behavior in real time. Hmm. Like, was there, any, was there any kind of feedback between what, what was played back essentially or processed? Yeah, the that's a great question. I I don't think so, but I I mean it's not if that happened, it's not mentioned in the documentation of the piece. But uh -huh. um, but that's a great question because it is kind of like um, as I was kind of saying towards the end of the talk, right? It's like it's not like it's not like you as the observer are not also in the space, right? Um, and like your observe your your practice of observation is like I often think about. Or, I mean, like I've gone birding with friends where we're like, oh, like the birds are people watching. Like when we're staring, we're like, what, what do they think about us? Like pointing these like weird objects at them. Like, it's not like they don't see us doing that. Um, and so like, yeah, that would be really interesting to know like what was the kind of the other side, the other, um, the places experience of that piece. Yeah. Cause I know that Sandy Stone used minor birds um, to try to study stuttering, like the, the object of the experiment was to see, to, to sort of figure out how stuttering could be, could be, uh, could be treated. And uh, when they, what they did was they played back on a very short delay speech by minor birds to the minor birds. Mm. And that produced a stuttering minor bird over time. Oh, wow. Yeah, no, it's um, it's Super reminding me of the, this is the other book I have on my desk. Wait, let me go turn the thing on. Oh yeah, so the Bird Way, another big recommendation um, by Jennifer Ackerman. There's a part where she's talking about um, I think it's Kia birds in New Zealand. Could be wrong, but there's a type of bird where they make a sound that appears to have a similar. Um, not function, but it seems to be somewhat analogous to like human laughter. Like they make the sound when they're playing. Um, and they found that playing the sound to the birds, like put them in that mood. <laughs> like, 
played this sound, like they would start getting really wacky and like do like hanging upside down and stuff. Um, which is like, you know, similarly like humans, like if you hear people laughing, it kind of like puts your brain in that like humorous kind of like state of mind. So yeah. Thank you. So thank you so much. Um I, I think um we're ending this whole lecture series on visual culture with the feeling that you just shared that uh, closer observation on your part leads to more awareness of being observed as well and being in the uh, awareness of how you are in the world as an observer and uh, that, is a, that is a very beautiful thought to end on thank you um, with that I think uh, we want to conclude this session and uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, praise and feedback in the chat thank you all for coming today and uh, thanks again, Arts and Design, for making this whole lecture series possible. Jenny, any last words? Um, happy bird noticing to everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Onwards. Take care. Goodbye. Thanks so much.